And we'll pick up in chapter in verse 24 this week. But I do want to finish our discussion of verse 23, which and we'll have to start in 22. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanness in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Now, this was written 2,000 years ago, and we know that at that time, lots of people worshipped stars, or they worshipped the moon, or they worshipped, or they worshipped snakes, or they worship, or they made idols and worship. And we think, and we think that that's what idolatry is all about. But the fact is that anything we worship other than the one living God is idolatry. And I, I want to just turn real quickly and read one very short passage in Revelation, Revelation 9.20, which basically talks about the same thing. It says, But the rest of mankind, who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. So when you start thinking of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, now we're talking about money, we're talking about jewelry, we're talking about our homes, uh, yeah, our cars. And I mean, now we're talking about the works of our hands that include metals and wood and not 2,000 years ago, but today we can certainly include plastic in that. Um, so clearly, clearly God is warning us against worshiping, placing our trust, placing too much emphasis on anything that's not God. Jesus over in Luke uh, 14, 33 says, if you mu would be my disciple, you must give up everything you own. Some translation said, if you would be my disciple, you may, be, you may possess nothing. And that word possess in Greek has the connotation of holding on to it. So those things that, that, so those things that, that we trust instead of God become idols. Um, now, like most of us, I have a handgun by the bed, and I'm prepared to use it under circum circumstances. But, but the Bible says to be as shrewd as serpents and as gentle as doves. Uh, I don't see anything in the Bible that says don't use any common sense, don't provide for yourself. But quite frankly, I don't trust that gun to protect my family. I trust the Lord to protect my family. Uh, when we first moved here 16 years ago, I was so excited. I had sandy soil and I was going to have a big garden and I built a bunch of raised beds and I spent a bunch of money on fancy dirt and I mixed up some nice soil and I planted seeds and I had, I had tomatoes and beans and peas and watermelons and I just had food. And I got home from work one day and the leaf cutter ants had left me nothing but stems. <laughs> and I had to reach the conclusion that I'm not counting on that garden to feed me. I am counting on God to feed, whether it's through the garden or whether it's through HEB or whether it's manna from heaven. It's God that feeds me. It's God that protects my home and anything that I place more trust in 
then God becomes an idol here, makes me a fool, makes my heart foolish. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, because we did this, or because there were those who did this, who placed their trust in things other than God, God also gave them up to uncleanness. He just, he just removed his influence. He just removed his revelation of himself in their lives and, and let, them, let them follow the, the instincts, the urges, the, the, the propensities of their own flesh in the lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. What is the lie? The lie is anything other than this. The lie is that there is no heaven, there is no hell, God's not going to hold us accountable, there is no judgment. And, and that lie takes a lot of forms. Um, I've been in churches I have been in, in fact, I have been a youth pastor and had youth try to convince me that, that they could sleep with whoever they wanted to and they could do whatever drugs they wanted to and whatever abundance they wanted to. They could abuse their bodies however they wanted to, but because, because they were saved, it was okay because they went down to the front of the church and let the pastor dunk them in the water. It was okay. And I have to admit that I believed that for many years. And it's the lie. It is the lie. The fact is, under no circumstances can we be led by the flesh for the rest of our lives and go to heaven. Paul says, Paul says, the one who is led by the flesh shall die, but if by the Spirit we put to death the deeds of the flesh, we shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit, these are the sons of God. Verse 26, for this reason God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust for one's ano one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of the error which was due. Now, I want us to be careful here. We're about to get into a whole list of, of characteristics of those who are not saved. A list of characteristics of behaviors that are not compatible with the kingdom of God. And there's several lists. There's a list over in 1 Corinthians. There's a list over in Revelation. There's a number of lists of these things. And, and we want to be careful not to get focused on any one issue. The, the, it is not sin that lands us in hell. It is unrepentance. It is unbelief that lands us in hell. Now, when we're unrepentant, and we don't believe, then we feel f comfortable to do all these things that, that, that satisfy our flesh that fall into these lists. And, and the reason I want to be careful here is because um, oftentimes in the jail, for example, we'll get to one of these lists and the guys will jump all over homosexuality. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Homosexual. And they're going, oh, it's so disgusting. Oh, they're going to go to hell. Oh, there's no hope for Whoa, whoa, time out, guys, time out, time out, time out, time out. Have you ever lied? You ever stolen anything? You ever gossiped? You ever heard something about somebody and turned around and wanted to go tell the next person? Have you ever fornicated? Oh, wait a minute, you're getting personal. Come on, guys, it's in the same list, in the same exact list. It's easy to pick on something that we don't do. So you find homosexuality disgusting? Praise God. 
But, but for you to jump on that and say, there's the problem, and, and ignore the fact that, that you commit adultery when you get a chance, or you commit fornication when you get a chance, or you lie, or you steal, or you do anything, is, is, uh, is, uh, is judgment that is in itself a sin. Yes, in fact, Jesus, Jesus gets real blunt in the fifth, sixth chapter of Matthew. He says, if I look at a woman, because it makes me feel good to look at her, I, I'm guilty. He says, if, I, if I'm angry with my brother, if I'm, if I'm holding a grudge against my brother, I'm, I'm guilty of murder. And it, and it goes on to say, if I don't forgive my brother of whatever he does, I won't be forgiven. And it goes on to say that I have no authority to judge at all. In fact, for me to judge is a sin, and I will come under judgment. And so we need to understand that Paul isn't saying, you shall know those who are going to hell because they commit this sin. He's just saying that when God takes his hands off, when God stops revealing himself, when God stops stops working on us through our conscience, when, when he knows whom he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to the image of Christ, and those whom he foreknew were going to reject him, he gave over to vile passions. Those include homosexuality, but they also include well, they include, we'll, we'll, in fact, we'll, we'll just read the list. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. I'm not even going to dig into that list, but just look at what it says. Sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness. That's uh, that list covers an awful lot, and I look at covetousness, and and I, in fact, over in Hebrews it says, it says, do not covet, but be content with such as you have. So what this says is, anytime, anytime my thought is, God, you haven't provided abundantly enough for me. Anytime my thought is, you know, I. Doggone my neighbor, he's got a, his car's almost new and mine's got 200,000 miles on it. Anytime I, anytime I desire more than what God's provided, provided, I fall into this list and that's, well, that's really easy to do. That is really easy to do. And I'm going to venture to guess that everybody in here has done that at some point. So, so the good news and uh, Paul's going to get to the good news, but I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. I'm going to flip over to uh, I'm going to flip over to First Corinthians. And we're going to basically see that same list again. This is uh, First Corinthians. This is First Corinthians six nine. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So we can be any of these things. Our family can be any of these things. Our friends can be any of these things. Our coworkers can be any of these things. And the wonderful news is 
if at some point they repent of those things and by the Spirit put to death the deeds of the flesh, they shall be saved. They shall be saved. They shall be, their name shall be found in the Lamb's book of life. But it's those who did not like to retain God in their knowledge. We talked about this last week. Most people I talk to, if you press them, they will admit that, yeah, they, they believe there's a God. Well, that's because there is a God. But they don't want to retain the knowledge of God. They really, they, they, they get a snippet of this, or, or maybe they meet someone who claims to be a Christian who's condescending, or maybe they hear some stuff on television, or uh, maybe they were forced to go to Sunday school when they were a kid. Whatever it is, they have this attitude that, well, if I were to believe, if I were to believe in God, if I were to believe in Jesus, then whatever, I'd have to give up my lusting. I'd have to give up my covetousness. I'd have to give up my fill-in-the-blank. And I would have to start allowing God to take control, to tell me what to do. I'd have to start living righteously. Now, we're not the ones who live righteously, but if we let, if we let, if we let the Holy Spirit direct our lives, the Holy Spirit is truly righteous. And to the extent that we're led by the Spirit, we're righteous. And they don't want that. Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. I don't like my conscience bothering me. I, I encounter this a lot. People say, well, the problem is that I'm, and I'm just going to fill one in. I'm not saying this is any worse than anything, but the problem is I'm an alcoholic. And I just hate myself when I drink. Then why do you drink? Well, I can't help it. What's that? Yeah, because when I'm not drinking, I can't stand the thought of not having another drink. Uh, people tell me the same thing about drugs. They tell me the same thing about sex. Well, you know, if God expects me to just give up, you know, and they're not married, uh, if God expects me to just like give up sex, then well, I guess I'm just going to have to go to hell. You know, people that can say that, first of all, don't understand, either don't believe that there is a hell, or don't understand the horror of being separated from God forever. Just do not comprehend the horror of that. But the fact is, they don't want to. They don't want to. If they wanted to, they would dig into this word and they would pray about it and God would reveal the truth to them and they would receive the truth and let the truth change them. The truth would set them free. But they do not want to retain God in their knowledge. So God said, fine, do it your way. Now, he doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't want to do that. He doesn't like to do that. Over in Ezekiel, it says, Do I have any pleasure? Do I take any pleasure that the sinner should die and not that he should live? Over in Peter, it says, Second uh, um, Peter, it says, I would that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. In Luke, in the 13th chapter of Luke, we read the story of the gardener coming to the, to the fruit tree and finding it, no fruit on it. And he says to the gardener, he says, this tree's been here for three years. It's time it made fruit, and it's not. Chop it down. And the gardener says, the gardener says, Master, leave it one more year. Let me dig around it. Let me fertilize it. Let me water it. Let, 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 let me give it one more chance. And the, the master says, okay. But if I come back next year and it's still not bearing fruit, we're going to cut it down. To me, that's a very graphic picture of God. And the fact is, God knows our end from our beginning. He already knows. I, I, my, and it doesn't say this, I haven't found it in so many words in the Bible, but I, don't, I think God doesn't want anybody to be able to say, but you didn't even give me a chance. He gives everybody a chance. He gives everybody an opportunity. Nobody has an excuse. And he already knows whose name is in the Lamb's Book of Life and whose name isn't. And for those whose name isn't, at some point, I think the this is how I read it. The response is, I gave you every opportunity. 
You can look around and see that I exist. You don't want to believe that I exist. You're not going to, and therefore, you're on your own. Chapter 2, therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge, practice the same things. That's what we were just talking about. We can't look at somebody and say, oh, that's such a vile sin, or you are so deep in it, or you are so far down in the pit. We can recognize sin for what it is. In fact, we're expected to recognize sin for what it is. But we have no authority for judge. It, we're not the ones who give people over to the depravities of their hearts. We're not the ones who remove our hands or our protection. We're not the ones who put names in the Lamb's Book of Life or not. We are, and, and we're not the one who decides when that tree is going to get cut down. We are not ever the ones. Uh, Brother David has said this often, and, and I just couldn't agree more. If, uh, if a drunkard walks in that back door, praise God. If an adulterer walks in that back door, praise God. If a homosexual walks in that back door, praise God. We're not here to say, whoa, 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 Christians only, because we don't know. We're not here to say, oh, 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 clean people only, good smelling people only, nicely dressed people, what, 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 no ties, you know. We're not here to say, King James Version only. We're not, we're not, we're here, hopefully, we've humbled ourselves before God, and, and our attitude is that, is that what we want more than anything else is for as many people as possible to come under the sound of the gospel as Paul says, that some might be saved. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. How then shall they hear if nobody tells them, if nobody preaches? You are inexcusable, O oh man, whoever you are who judge. Well, that's, that's a pretty absolute statement. We're not here to look at that list and say, I, 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 you're on that list. Uh, in fact, when I look on that list, I think, ooh, I've done that. that, done that. Ooh, I've done that. Ooh, you're getting kind of personal now. Um, but you were <laughs> saved, but you were washed, but you were sanctified Amen. by the blood of Jesus Christ. Romans 2, 2. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. The judgment of God, not the judgment of us, not the judgment of man, but the judgment of God. And the judgment of God is righteous. It is absolute. It is, it is pure. It is holy. There's, there's no gray area. There's no wishy-washy. No, when I stand in front of the judgment seat of God, He's not going to say, uh, Ted, I'm still reviewing your case. You stand here to the side for a minute while I go back over some files. We're either a sheep or we're a goat. And, and we know that the judgment of God is according to truth. God's going to know in truth what we thought, what we said, what we did, what we believed. If we said one thing and really believed something else, if we tried to fake it, if we, if we were humble before Him or not, as, as much as the Bible tells us that we need to be meek and we need to be humble, if you read it closely, we need to be meek and we need to be humble before God. Uh, if we're pretending to be meek um, and we're still arrogant in our hearts, our attitude is still, I thank you, God, I'm not as other men. God knows. And his judgment is according to truth against those who practice such things. And that's all these things. And I don't think this is an exclusive list. I think any form of unrighteousness. Paul says over, he's going to say over here in the 14th chapter of Romans that anything we do that is not of faith is a sin. And God is going to make that determination 
not us.